All right. Uh, so I'm Anirudha Datta, and uh, uh, like I have taught this class a number of times. It's it's kind of intense because again, I mean, with zero molecular biology background, right? You're going to pick all that up in six weeks. Okay, so you have to put in a lot of work, right? Uh, a lot more than you know the amount of work that I will do in lecturing in the class. Okay, I had to put in that work because. You know, I'm an electrical engineering professor, but from 2001 to 2003, I took off from uh, from uh, teaching for two years and learned molecular biology, genetics, human nutrition, and so on in order to be able to do research in this area, right? So whatever I learned over two years, all right, and this biology material, um, in the beginning it was very hard, and then, uh, you know, and you forget, okay, because that book is like 600 pages. So by the time you get to the end of the book, you've forgotten what was at the beginning, right? So, uh, but... Uh, I think the best way to learn anything is to teach the class. So somebody suggested, why don't you give a class, you know, based on your two-year experience, and this is what it is. Okay, this course uh, uh, is is the culmination of uh, my experience in that uh, postdoctoral training program. Right. Uh, so the the point I'm trying to get across to you is that you're going to get a filtered version of all the information that uh, I had access to. Okay, so which is good, but at the same time, you know, for me it was a two-year thing, and even beyond that. You know, once I started teaching, then, you know, you're on your feet standing up, people will question you and all that, so you'll learn, you know, so. But, uh, but you'll have to do it pretty quickly, you know, because today is what, uh, September 1? By December 1, you know, the cor course will be over, okay, December 1 or, or, or December 3 or something like that, you know, the course will be over. And, uh, you know, the learning is not going to end because, you know, many of you are going to be working in this area, so, you know, I mean, I'm still learning, right? I'm not an expert in this, but at least the basic knowledge you need to know, okay? Some, some, some basic knowledge in biology you have to have. You have to have the domain knowledge. You cannot just go in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the age of interdisciplinary uh, science and engineering. You know, I'm an electrical engineer. I have Viterbi's algorithm. I'm going to just apply it. You know, it doesn't work that way. It has to come from the other side. You have to look at the biological problem of interest and then see if any of your tools uh, fit that uh, particular problem. Okay, let me start out by giving you an outline of the course, and, and here I have a number of bullets, and I'm going to try, and each one of those we are going to uh, you know, discuss in a lot of detail later on, but right now I'll try to give you some idea, you know. So, the first chapter is the introduction, right? And here we'll talk a little bit about cells, how cell membranes are made, you know, the cells are the building blocks of all life, and uh, <clears throat> so on, right? Then in the next chapter, we are going to do a review of organic chemistry because organic chemistry is the chemistry of co uh, uh, carbon compounds, all right? And it is basically the chemistry on which all of life is based, okay? So we have to do some review of that, right? Uh, you probably have been exposed to some of, some of it in, in your high school, right? At least I was, you know, many, many years ago. But uh, so we, we'll do a review of that. You know, even if you have forgotten, you should be fine, right? As long as you haven't forgotten everything that you ever learned from first grade, you know. If you remember something, you know, the, the, the light will click, right, when I start talking about this, all right. Then I will talk about en energy considerations in biochemical reactions. Now, see, living things, they have a tendency to create order, right, in a world that is tending towards disorder, okay. In your, like, in your apartment or in your home, okay, if you don't clean up, okay, it gets messed up more and more. So there is a natural tendency to, towards disorder, okay? Like that's the second law of thermodynamics, that the universe, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. But if you look at a living organism, it seems to be creating order in that universe, okay? Like a child grows from a single fertilized egg, has the right number of fingers, you know, the animals grow and thrive, so it's becoming orderly. Even you are fixing your own room, okay? So, so there must be some, I mean, are, are the, the question is, are the laws of thermodynamics violated? Okay, the answer is no, okay? Because there is disorder that is being created in the environment, okay? And so, you know, we have to determine, uh, you know, whether certain reactions are going to be feasible or not. So many of the reactions that make life possible, all right, they would not take place, all right, if the reactants were left to themselves, they would not take place for thousands of years, okay? But there are catalysts, right? Pro proteins that are called catalysts that will make those reactions take place, okay? So in order to determine whether a reaction is feasible or not, right, and then whether it actually occurs or not, you have to look at energy considerations. Like if you have a piece of paper, right? If you set a match to it, the thing burns, right? I mean, so the reaction is feasible, but if you don't uh, apply that heat source, you don't get the reaction going, right? So things like that, right, we'll talk about in that chapter. Then in the next chapter, we'll talk about proteins, right? Proteins are, 
uh, you know, very, very versatile molecules, right? And they're extremely important, right? Uh, the, you know, uh, like you, and, you, and you're familiar with many of these, okay? It's just that you may not know that they're proteins, right? Have you heard of adrenaline? Right. Yeah, that's a protein, right? Insulin, that's a protein. Hemoglobin, that's a protein, right? Rhodopsin, that's a protein, right? So, pro I mean, pr proteins are very, very versatile molecules, and they have, uh, like, uh, you know, they're made up of smaller units that we will talk about that are called amino acids. And then, you know, the right sequence of amino acids will produce the protein with exactly the right shape for that particular biological function. In fact, there are even fish in the Arctic Ocean, right, that use proteins as antifreeze, right? Like in cars, we use antifreeze, you know, but long before we had cars and all this antifreeze, you know, the fish were surviving in the Arctic region. You know, so they have proteins that function as those, okay? Then there are signaling molecules, like, yeah, those of us in the communications area, we think we're doing all this, you know, communications like broadcasting, there's a receiver and all that, you know. Your body ha need, needs a network of communication all the time, you know, and it is usually done through proteins, right? Then we'll also talk about DNA, right? Which is the, what is DNA? Anybody knows that? Yeah, deoxyribonucleic. So you have had some exposure to biology, right? Or, yeah, yeah, we are going to do basic biology only. What I meant was not... Not biology for MDs, you know, basic biology, right? <laughs> that I'm talking about, right? So this is, DNA is the deoxyribonucleic acid, and this is like the code, okay? So the proteins are the, are the molecules that perform a lot of the functions. The DNA is the code, right, that is present and uh, that is used to produce these proteins, right? And how that is done, from DNA to go to protein, you have to go through an intermediate that is called an RNA, and that's where all this transcription and translation takes place. How do you go from DNA? Right, the code that is there in the cell, because not every cell is producing every protein all the time. Okay? For example, insulin is produced only by the beta cells in the pancreas. Right? Hemoglobin is produced only by the red blood cells, not by other cells. Okay? So there must be, you know, and as engineers you know that, you know, you know about zero ones and things turning on and off. Okay? So how, does the, how do those switches operate? You know? So we'll talk about transcription and translation. Then we'll talk about chromosomes and gene regulation. Now if you look at a human cell, there are three billion letters in there. So that's an enormous amount of information, okay? And, you know, if you lay it out, it'll probably be like a... Uh, but, but it is contained in something that is uh, to the tune of micrometers, really small, right? So, but the packaging has to be good because it cannot be like a mess, like your closet, you just dumped everything. Then when you need something, you cannot find that, okay? But the DNA must be packaged in a way where everything can be retrieved whenever it's needed, okay? So this packaging is carried out using uh, what are called chromosomes, all right? And then we'll talk about gene regulation. Gene regulation means a stretch of DNA turning on or off at the appropriate time, okay? How, how is that done? Then we'll talk about genetic variation, right? That is what is responsible for the large variety of life that you see on this earth, okay? We all supposedly evolved from a common ancestor, right? And then under selective pressure to survive, you have mutations, so there'll be genetic variation. But that genetic variation in nature occurs in a very unpredictable, all right, and random way, okay? So is there a way to produce genetic variation in the lab? It can be done, right? And that's done using DNA technology. Like today it is possible for you to produce mice that are diabetics, all right, by going and knocking out the insulin gene, right? You can do that because you want to study the effect of a, an anti-diabetic drug, right? You can get knockout mice. They're commercially available, okay? You can buy them and use in your experiments, right? So there's DNA technologies there. You can either knock out genes, you can add extra genes, right? And by, you know, messing around with this, you can do all kinds of things, right? Some of it, of course, is ethical, some of it is legally allowed, some of it not, so. Next, we'll move on to a discussion of cell division, and that is very important. A lot of the work, right, at least the work of our lab related to genomic signal processing is concerned with cancer, right? So you have to understand what cancer is, and cancer is a disease that affects multicellular organisms, right? And it has to do some, it has something to do with cell division. Now, you know, see, if you're, if you're thinking of unicellular organisms like bacteria or yeast, right, if you give them enough food and nutrients, they will just keep on multiplying, okay? And, of course, the temperature and the ambient conditions have to be right. They'll just keep on multiplying. But if you look at a multicellular organism, all right, the cell division is under very tight control, all right? Each one of us is made up of about 100 trillion cells, okay? But we don't see like our noses and ears falling off every second day. You know, it's under tight control. And believe it or not, there is a lot of cell division going on, all right? The cells on your skin 
are replaced once every 10 days. Okay, so you lost old skin, you got new skin. The cells lining your gut, they are replaced once every three days. Okay, so there is some kind of a dynamic equilibrium, right? Where the rate at which new cells are produced, right, is roughly the same as the rate at which old cells are being removed or, or, or killed. Okay, and when that is disrupted, so that, and that is needed to maintain the architecture of the tissue. When that is disrupted, that's when you get cancer. Okay. If suddenly cell division turns on, okay, and, and there is good reason for cell division to turn on at the right time, because if you have a child developing in a womb, all right, in nine, nine months a single fertilized egg is going to give you an individual, all right, so cell division has to be really turned on. On the other hand, if you have a cut, all right, if you had surgery or a wound, all right, if there is dynamic, if there is an equilibrium there, that wound is never going to heal, all right, because cell division has to take place at a faster rate than the rate at which the cells are dying. Okay? And there are genes and there are signaling molecules that make sure that that happens. But what if cell division turns on even when there is no stimulus? Okay? You don't need more cells, there are cells being produced. Guess what? You'll get a tumor. Right? After some time, that tumor can become malignant. And, and that's... So we will look at the connections between cell division, uh, then what is this cell cycle control, and cell death, which is uh, called apoptosis and cancer. Right? So this will be the end of our discussion of molecular biology. Okay, all these chapters I will cover. All right. Then we will move on to, so this is the biology, molecular biology part. Then we go into the engineering part. Right. So we will talk about expression microarrays, which basically allow you to measure the activity of thousands of genes at the same time. So you can think of this as a gene chip. Right. See, only the VLSI guys shouldn't be the only ones that are having the chip, or the computer guys. Okay, the gene chip, you can have thousands of genes, and today it is possible to have the entire human genome, right? all the genes on a single chip. Right? So how do you simultaneously measure the activity of thousands of genes at the same time? Okay. That's expression microarrays. Then with that data that you have from the microarrays, right, you want to do things that engineers typically do. You might want to do disease classification. Okay, how do you decide? Okay, looking at that expression pattern of, of those different genes. Okay, how, or the activity pattern of the different genes. Can you go ahead and distinguish between cancer and normal tissue, or different stages of of cancer and so on? Okay, so that will take you to the area of classification, which is basically a, math, a mathematical area in pattern recognition. Then we'll do clustering, where you try to group similar items together. We'll talk about that. Then we'll move on to uh, see the the. The genes typically interact with each other in a multivariate fashion. So you want to ca capture the multivariate activity, right? So you will talk about regulatory networks. And then once you've done the modeling using regulatory networks, you really want to intervene, okay? I'm a controls person, so I can say that, you know, in, a, in most situations, you want to control something, okay? Right? I mean, you want to control the amount of money you're making in the stock market, okay? Or, I don't know, you want to control your grade, whatever, right? You're trying to control something. So you're not interested in just modeling something and just passively looking at it, okay? You want to do something with it, right? So how do you do, do intervention, okay? You, let's say you modeled uh, the signaling mechanism inside a cell using a genetic regulatory network, and now you want to control the cell, okay? You want to control the behavior of the cell so that if it is cancerous, so hopefully you can induce it to die, okay? Or slow down its growth or something, all right? And then I'll talk about external intervention based on optimal control theory. I'll add a few more things, you know, that we have uh, worked on recently. For example, you know, biologists have this information that is called pathway knowledge, right, where, like, they don't think in, in, in terms of multivariate signaling, okay? Like, they're looking at individual correlations, okay? So they say, okay, this gene affects that one, okay? But maybe, like an AND gate, okay, there might be many inputs that are driving that output, right? So... They, so they don't have that complete picture, right? So it's like if somebody looks at a, a blind person looks at an elephant, if they feel the ears, they'll say it's like a fan, right? If they feel the, the foot, they'll say it's like a tree trunk and so on, okay? But it's not the complete picture, right? So they don't have the complete picture. They have what is called pathway knowledge, okay? They think this affects this, this effect, in turn affects that one and so on, okay? So the question is, can you get uh, regulatory networks that incorporate that pathway information. That pathway information is correct, okay? It's, not, it's just that it's not the complete picture, right? That and then the pathway information also re represents prior knowledge, right? That you want to utilize, right? You do not want to throw all that knowledge away. Yeah, we, double E's, we might be pretty good at just getting data and inferring networks or, you know, or, or, or whatever, models from that, okay? But if you do have prior information, you probably will do better, okay? So the question is, how do you incorporate prior information uh, along with data to produce 
better networks. You know, some of you might be experts in Bayesian statistics and all that stuff. You know, so you you do. You can use those Bayesian approaches, but how to interface those things, that's a different story. That, those are research problems for you guys. Many of your PhD students, you're looking for research problems. So that's one thing that I will talk about a little bit, all right? Then another thing is, how many of you here are, are registered for a Dr. Yu's course, Peng Yu's course? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, uh, and uh, I thought there would be more people that would be registered, you know. I would highly like, how many of you are AgriLife supported students, all right? Yeah, I think you guys should take that course, you know, because that's the only way that you're going to be ready for the work that is wait, going to be waiting for you next semester. Because this course will give you the molecular background and whatever we are doing, right? That course will give you the introduction to next generation sequencing, right? And that's what you need to do. And I, I just want to briefly tell you what next generation sequencing is, okay? And that's what I'll talk about towards the end of the course. Like, you have these three billion letters, right? I mean, in the human genome. And there are four of them, A, G, C, or T at each location. So when you talk about sequencing the human genome, and you might, must have heard about that, the Human Genome Project, they spent like maybe a few billion dollars, you know, going and finding out, take somebody's genome and find out a, whether it is A, G, C, T, and C, right? Do it in a laborious fashion or it's serially. Today what they do is what they call next generation sequencing, where basically they will cut it up into pieces, okay? And they will sequence the individual pieces. And they'll do it many, many times, okay? So each time it's a random cut at a different location, right? So, they get, so the advantage is that if you have so many pieces and you're doing it so many times, all right, you have a lot of samples that you can quickly sequence, all right, and then you have to assemble the original genome. All right. So the next generation sequencing is about that. There are algorithms that are available for doing that, right? but uh, th that is largely replacing these microarrays. Right? So instead of looking at the activity of genes using microarrays, people are you know, collecting uh, the output of the microarray and then subjecting it to next generation sequencing. And here... At our center, we do have the ability to do that next generation sequencing. In fact, we have the latest state-of-the-art machines to, to do, do that kind of stuff. But this is going to be important for anybody that is going to do next generation sequencing. I would highly recommend that you also uh, register for a Peng Use class. I'm not campaigning, right? Believe me, I'm, I'm not campaigning. You know, I, I, I don't have any financial incentive or anything like that, you know, to put more. I think he maybe he already has enough students, you know, but... I'm, I'm just saying that it's not offered every time. Like the, even this class is offered every other year, right? And the only reason I'm teaching it this semester is because I know there are a lot of new students that have come in that need to, you know, uh, uh, basically absorb this material in order to be able to successful, uh, be successful in their research. All right, any questions? So, yeah, go ahead. Where is the what application? So, Is our course any relationship to the electricity? No, not electricity. No, see, okay. Yeah, no, no, the person who recommended the course told you to ask that what is the relationship. No, see, these topics, okay, these topics, all this stuff, these are done in electrical also, okay. It is not related to electricity, all right. But, uh, you know, these are topics that we study in electrical engineering. See, electri see, in electrical engineering, we do communications, we do controls, we do signal processing, we do solid state, you know. Everything is not uh, exactly uh, related to, like we do pattern recognition. It's not related to electricity, right? Okay, but, but electrical engineering, that way, is all-encompassing, okay? We claim the computer science, computer engineering, everything, okay? Right, I mean? And now, yeah, even, even the bio thing also, that's why... You know, if you have biomedical, it's a separate department. But in electrical, you also have the bio groups also, right? Yeah. No, these are topics that you would find. Uh, these are in, uh, interdisciplinary topics, but, you know, ele electrical engineers have uh, been working in these things too. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, the last few topics that you mentioned, is it covered in the journals that you have uh, Which ones? Uh, uh, well, these are covered in books also, okay? Now... Now, let, let me get to that, okay? Now, I mentioned these journal papers and all that, you know, at the appropriate time, I will point out, okay, which journal, pa uh, which, uh, journal paper it is, okay? This list is not complete, uh, and uh, right now, the GSP lab is in the process of moving to that center, okay? So maybe everything, like, she, she, but uh, her problem was unique, actually, so maybe that's not the issue. I thought that because of that, she might not have been able to access the, the particular paper. Uh, so... 
now regarding the material i'm going to make the powerpoint slides for this class available to you okay that'll be available now regarding the book all right i'm uh, if you look at the handout right all right have you guys looked through the through the handout any any questions over there uh, if you look at the handout i have put in a, a reference on molecular biology essential cell biology right now for the other items i have not put in any reference or any book okay because there is a book by myself and, and dr doherty right i used to put it as a text but now there is a new requirement okay so i don't want to get into that even, even if you don't have the, have that book you should be fine because i'm these notes are pulled right out from there because there is a new requirement because of conflict of interest you know if you guys buy those books we can i might become rich or whatever okay so because of that you know uh, that we are required to you know contact the publisher okay if i tell you to buy that book if you buy that book uh, i have to contact the publisher and tell them that you know i shouldn't be making any money and all that so instead of doing all that stuff i figured that a much cheaper fix and easier thing for me to do is just to not to recommend the book you know so right because then i didn't recommend it and you can because the 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 notes are pulled the powerpoint notes are pulled out directly from there right unless you want the verbiage you know then you don't need the book right okay but the molecular biology book will be a good resource right not just for this class if after this class you still want i mean you are working in this area right that is at the interface of engineering and the life sciences right then uh, that that'll be a, that'll be a good play, uh, reference book you know. and maybe there is a later edition i put 1998 because that's the one that i have okay but you can probably get a later edition and uh, and this version of the book is okay for people like us but for md's the, these same authors have written another book that is much more detailed okay that's probably called molecular biology of the cell or something like that you know so. all right any questions okay so let's get started with the introduction so first we talk about a cell right so this is molecular bi biology so we is going to be the biology of the cell so what is a cell a cell is the basic unit of life right and nothing smaller than a cell is is living like a cell has to have the ability to replicate itself right like we hear about viruses a virus is not a living object okay virus is basically some dna or rna inside a protein coat a virus is going to replicate the, the uh, is going to hijack the replication machinery of the cell to make more copies of itself that's how you get sick okay when you get sick all right all the runny nose and all that those are the dead cells okay those are the, that's the cytoplasm from the dead cells that are coming out the virus has killed all the cells and made more copies of itself all right so anyway a cell is the basic unit of life it's the smallest unit of life all living creatures are made of cells so if you're if it's a human you're looking at about 100 trillion cells okay if it's a bacteria it's a bacterium it's a single cell right now typically the size of a, the cells are very small in size they could be like 5 to 20 micrometers in diameter so in order to study cells you would need microscopes right so in the, in the 19th century the development of the microscope is what helped cell biology right they could see different things like cell dividing and all that under a microscope right? now uh, you know cells can be of, of different types so you can have plant cell animal cell you can have uh, what are called prokaryotic cells eukaryotic cells. i'll talk about those right but here i have a diagram of a typical plant cell okay so you have uh, this uh, delimiting membrane which is called the plasma membrane okay that's the outer membrane and inside the cell you have many different compartments all right now if it is a if it's a bacterial cell you're not going to have any compartments inside okay if it is not a bacterial cell then you're going to have different compartments so say for example and they have different functions all right for example this compartment called the mitochondrion is the one where energy most of the energy generation of the cell takes place it's like the powerhouse of the cell all right Uh, you, then this uh, uh, this compartment or organelle called the chloroplast is the place where this is a plant cell so where photosynthesis takes place right where energy from sunlight is captured right and converted into sugars or right, into carbohydrates then you have another org uh, compartment that is called the endoplasmic reticulum which is where a lot of the cell pr products needed by the cell are synthesized golgi apparatus this is another compartment where you know these products undergo further modification then there there is an organelle that is called peroxisome where certain reactions inside cells may be producing hydrogen peroxide 
that's a toxic chemical okay so the cell is going to compartmentalize that inside inside that organelle okay so and I, on the next slide i have all that stuff written there right so the mitochondria once again mitochondrion is the site for energy generation right chloroplast is and chloroplast will be present only in a plant cell these are the sites where photosynthesis takes place then the, the, Oh, I didn't talk about the nucleus. I'll talk about it right now. Then I talked about the endoplasmic reticulum, where many of the cellular components are synthesized. Then we have the Golgi apparatus, where the synthesized components undergo appropriate modifications. And then this is the plasma membrane. Then this is the peroxisome. And then, of course, there's this nucleus, which is probably the most important organelle, because it contains the DNA. All, right. All the genetic information of the cell is contained in the nucleus. Now, in terms of terminology, the cytosol is basically the cell, right? The interior of the cell with all the organelles removed. So if you take all these organelles out, right, you basically have some kind of a gel inside, okay? And that is called the cytosol. Right. Now, there are... Two, all right, any questions? So there are two broad categories of cells. Okay, before this, I think I should at least talk about the... I know you guys didn't have any questions about the, uh, the handout, but you have no questions about exams and all that either? Right. Or maybe your grad students, you came here just for the learning. Okay, you don't care about the exams and grades, right? So, but anyway, let me, just, yeah, let me just go over some of this information quickly. All right? so, uh, so I gave you my phone number, my email address. My office is in the Weizenbaker building, right, 212F. And I'm going to have office hours. So I have this class till 1.30. And then 150 to 240, I have another class in that building, okay? So then by 3 o'clock, I'll get back in my office. So between 3 and 4, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that's when I'll hold my office hours. If you need to see me at some other time, send me an email, then we'll try to send, set something up, okay? I'm usually on campus on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesday, Thursdays, I'm off campus, all right? But, I mean, we'll see if there's an emergency or something, we can work that out. Now... Now, there will be two exams in this class, okay, and they are based on molecular biology, okay. So you can start studying today itself, all right, because the first exam is on October 3rd, all right. Friday, October 3rd is first exam, molecular biology. Uh, Monday, November 3rd is the second exam, again on molecular biology, okay. So there will be two exams, and those two exams together will count towards 50% of the grade, okay. Now, in the past, I used to, you know, ask the graduate students, how many of you are here? One, two, three, four. How many of you are here? Yeah, in the, in the past, what I would ask the grad students to do is to uh, present a paper, okay? Like you will pick up some paper in the, in the bioinformatics genomics area, and then each one will make a, like a 20-minute pre presentation, right? 15, 20-minute presentation, right? And that would count towards 50% of the grade, you know? But then maybe that's a little bit too uh, risky, right? People pr prefer... Fine. You don't like it? Or? No, so that's why this time I've changed it, okay? I said, okay, there'll be some homework that'll count towards 20% and make that presentation only 30%, all right? No final. No final, no. So you can start the party tonight, okay? Huh? So yeah. can we use that dictionary during the test? Dictionary? No, 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 no. Then we should learn how to write these words? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. But you have time. You have one month, okay? That's why I said it's not a... It'll look very easy because I'm lecturing on the class. I've been dealing with this thing for 10 years, okay? So it looks very easy, okay? There's no shortcut. You will have to learn the terminology, okay? So you don't have to memorize, but keep looking at the notes. And every time you look at it, it's like reinforcement learning, right? You learn a little bit better, okay? So... So that's... Uh, and the homeworks will be the thing that will cover, like, Classification, remember I talked about the engineering methods, classification, clustering, and all that. So when the undergrads would take this class, I used to give them some homework, all right? So that they can at least get a feel for what... Uh, so I'll, I'll probably give you guys the same homework to do, you know. So it'll be easy homework, but an easy 20% that way, all right? And then you do the uh, paper presentation. So any, any questions? Yeah. So how do we hand in the homework? Your print or just via the email? Or? I don't know. You probably print it in, you know. Because okay. I'll give it to somebody to get, you know. We, we'll see what to do, you know, so. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, although that's a minor thing, we can uh, address that later, you know. I don't think that's going to be a stumbling block. 
no. No, there's no, pr but you will get a chance to do, I know you are working in the next generation sequencing and all that, you'll get a lot, lot of chance to do programming over there and whatever, learn Python and all that stuff, you know. Not in this course, maybe in the other course you will. Are you taking Pengu's course or you have taken it already? Yeah, you might, oh no, you are switching to something else, so that's right, yeah. But uh, in his class, I think you will have to do programming. Huh? Yes. Yeah, you will have to do, see, in this class, I'm happy if you learn molecular biology, okay? That's not easy, all right? It's going to be quite a bit of work, all right? And you have to study every day and, but, you know, people have survived and that's the only way. You, otherwise, you have to sp take three courses in, in the biology department, you know, so you don't have time, time to do that. All right, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you guys get to select, you know. You can look at the current literature, you know, just get it okayed by me and and make a good presentation. You know, so. uh, this is done right at the end. Right at the end of the, like if we have, uh, let's say if we have 50, uh, 15 people, you know, then maybe if three people present every lecture, okay. I mean the class is 50 minutes, but if I get like 10 minutes more, maybe 20 minutes each, 15, 20 minutes each, so three people, so we need five lectures, right. Right? So the class will get finished because I have the PowerPoint slides and, you know, I've been doing this over and over again. For me, it's easy. You, you have to learn. That's the thing, okay? So the class will get finished, all right? And then maybe the last five classes of the semester will be when people will make the presentations. Yeah. So no final. So that pressure is gone. And wh one more thing that you can note down, okay? There will be no class on October 31st, okay? Because I have to attend a meeting. Yeah, I have to attend a meeting and they told me to cancel all classes, okay, 8 to 5, uh, October 30th and 31st, I'm, I'm booked, I cannot take any classes, so, so we are planning a vacation or whatever, I, <laughs> all right, so there are two broad categories of cells, okay, and you don't have to learn blindly, see, prokaryotes, right, or prokaryotic cells, they do not contain a nucleus and other organelles. This uh, Greek word carrion supposedly means a nucleus or a kernel, all right? Pro means before, okay? So, be, so supposedly all living organisms originated from, this, from the common ancestor. So in the beginning, they did not have any nucleus, okay? And the, and the bacteria do not have nucleus, all right? So those are called prokaryotes, right? That's one part of the kingdom of life, all right? And eukaryotes or eukaryotic cells, they contain a nucleus. Example, human cells, yeast, etc. okay? So this is one big uh, uh, classification, right, in the kingdom of life. All right. Uh, now, if you look at the composition of the cell, right, I showed you the cytosol, okay, that is the aqueous watery gel inside the cell. When you remove all the organelles, whatever is left over, that is called the cytosol, all right. The plasma membrane and the other membranes, they are made of lipids. Okay, so see the way the cell is made, okay, you know that oil and water do not mix, right? I mean, if you put some oil and water, they stay separate, okay? Same way, the, the boundary of the cell, all the membranes, they are made of oily stuff, okay? The stuff inside the cell is watery, okay? So they have a tendency not to mix. That's how all the cell membranes are formed, right? So plasma membrane and other membranes, they are made of what are called lipids. And lipids, it's something similar to oil, right? Lipids will have, a lipid molecule will have two parts. One part of it really likes water. It's called hydrophilic water mo uh, or water loving. Hydro is water, philic means loving. So water loving part and it also has a hydrophobic, right? Means afraid of water or water hating, right? Part, right? And this is what is, forms the basis of all cell membranes. Now if you look at the book on molecular biology, there is an entire chapter that is de de devoted to cell membranes, all right? and transport of materials across cell, cell membranes. We are not going to do that chapter simply because it's not very relevant for the purposes of this course, okay? As a result, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about this lipid bilayer in the, in the subsequent slide, right? This is the basis of all cell membranes, lipid bilayer, all right? How is it formed? So typically a molecule forming a lipid bilayer will have this form, okay? It has got a hydrophilic part, a head that really loves water, and then it has two tails, and, 
and when we cover the next chapter, you will know why it has two tails here, okay, not three, okay. So hydrophilic head and hydrophobic tails. These guys hate water, okay. So if you throw a bunch of these molecules inside water, okay, they will naturally align up in this in this way. They will form a sphere, all right, with the hydrophilic part facing the water, the hydrophobic part staying away from the water. Okay, so they will all fo they will form this bilayer. There'll be two layers. Okay, so this is all hydrophilic. There's hydrophilic here. There's water in, water out, and inside inside this hydrophobic region, right, that hates water. That's where all the hydrophobic tails have gone. Okay. So this is how all the cell membranes are formed. Okay, the membranes in our cells are formed this way. This has got very neat properties. Like, you know, if you just throw these molecules in water, it'll automatically assemble into that shape. Okay. If you take a needle and you try to put a push a hole through, the thing will move apart, right? You can put stuff in, right? And then when you take the needle out, again it reforms. Okay, it's a self sealing self sealing membrane. Yes, sir. No, the picture, this represents a cell membrane, like if you think of a three-dimensional space, all right? So it's a concentric, two concentric circles, okay? What I'm saying is that if you take a molecule, like a bunch of molecules like this, that has a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part, you throw it in water. The part that hates water is going to try to stay away from water. The part that likes water is going to try to stay in contact with water. No, the region between the two surfaces is stuff that hates water all the way. So it's going to form a membrane, okay? So you have water inside, you have water outside. In between, you have this barrier, okay? You have this barrier that hates water, okay? So that's the basis of all cell membranes. That's how all our membranes are formed, okay? Self-sealing membranes, yes. Oh, yeah, the differences um, between the inner part and the outer part. What is the what? No, no, the inner, it may not be a circle, it might, it'll, it's just that these molecules have lined up like this, yeah. No, no differences, yeah. Uh, the, the important thing to note, the take-home message is that the part that loves water will stay in contact with the water, okay? The part that hates water will try to stay away from the water. In the process, you have this membrane that is formed, okay? Okay, water outside, water inside, in between, no water, okay? So now the question arises, if I have some watery stuff, I want to push it out from here to inside over there, okay, how do I do that, okay? That can be done because what is going to happen, and that's called vesicular transport, all right? Like the watery stuff will get pinched off from the boundary, okay? Inside a, inside a capsule like this with a lipid exterior, it'll go through this, uh, through this liquid medium to wherever it needs to go. And over there again, the boundaries will fuse because they are again lipid bilayer, okay, they'll fuse and the watery content will be transferred in, inside, okay? So that's the mechanism by which, uh, let's say something is produced in a particular compartment in a cell, okay, inside the lipid environment, okay? In, I mean, inside the aqueous environment surrounded by the lipid oil layer. It needs to be transported somewhere, okay? It will go there, all right? This is like your packaging, all right? You want to send something by UPS, you package it nicely, okay? And then you send it, then you open it. So it's the same thing, okay? I mean, the, if you want to send some watery molecule, maybe water or something else, but past this lipid bilayer, how is that going to happen? Well, this is going to pinch off, take, encapsulate that watery stuff inside. Then it will move wherever it has to go, all right, to the other organelle that also has a lipid bilayer around it. And then the, then the bilayers are going to fuse, and the watery stuff is going to get transferred. So there is an entire chapter in that book that is devoted to this vesicular transport and, and uh, lipid bilayer and cell membrane and all that. And if you want more details, you can look, and look in there, okay? There is an elaborate system because you have to make sure, like, see, UPS or even the post office, they make mistakes all the time, right? So, th so there has to be some kind of labeling. Like, if you take something from here, it has to go to its correct destination. The cell has mechanisms for doing that, okay? Put a tag and then it'll make sure that it goes to the right place. Okay, any other questions? Now, if you look at the interior of the cell, okay, I said that you have these organelles, all right? But if you take the organelles out, you call it the cytosol, all right? But that's not a structureless soup. There are, in fact, a lot of other things in there. There is something that is called a cytoskeleton. That is the skeleton of the cell, which provides structure to the interior of the cell, all right? And the cytoskeleton is made up of three types of proteins. The first one is called actin filaments. These generate contractile forces, example, in muscle cells. That's how we move, okay, because of, through actin filaments. They will generate the force. 
Then there are others that are called microtubules. And in fact, there are tracks. Inside, inside the cell, there are tracks along which different cargo can be transported. Okay? The only difference between the highways that we have here and the tracks in the cell is that the tracks in the cell are laid out on an as-needed basis. They are not there all the time. Okay? When something needs to be transported, then the track is laid out and, and, and the thing can be transported. Okay? So the microtubules provide tracks along which different cell components can be moved. And they are also responsible for di distributing the DNA properly between the daughter cells at cell division. See, when a cell divides, okay, you have those three billion letters. They have to be copied without mistakes, right? Three billion of them, right? They have to be copied. And then you have to make sure that the two copies, each, each daughter cell receives an identical copy, right? Without mistakes, right? So that is carried out by these microtubules, okay? They form a structure that will separate out the two copies and make sure that each cell gets only one copy. Then there are also what are called intermediate filaments, which provide mechanical strength to the cell and its neighbors. So this is another, this cytoskeleton and its functions is also another chapter in that molecular biology book. Okay, I am not covering that in detail. I don't have time for it. Right? It's not very relevant for our purposes. That's why I provided a little bit more detail on this on this page. You don't have to go and you know read that chapter and memorize everything, but this is just for your information. Now. Now we'll talk about features that are common to all cells. Now cells vary enormously in size and function. If you look at a frog's egg, that is a single cell, but that's like one millimeter in diameter, right? On the other hand, if you look at the typical bacteria and that is there in yogurt, let's say, okay, that is just a few micro micrometers. So they vary a lot in size, all right? And the functions also are different, okay? The function of your red blood cells is quite different from the cells that make up your eye, okay? However, all cells, at least on this planet, all right? If you have life on another planet, maybe it's different, okay? But on this planet, they use the same underlying chemistry. The genetic information in the DNA is coded using the same blocks in all, all organisms, right? And also this information is interpreted using essentially the same machinery to produce proteins, okay? Across all living organisms on this planet. And in fact, proteins are made up of the same 20 blocks. Amino acids, I mentioned amino acids, we'll talk about them later. There are only 20 amino acids that occur over and over again in nature. From humans to the lowest organism, these are the only 20 amino acids you'll find. Okay, why aren't there others? I don't know. Okay, that's how it evolved, all right? So this, the fact that there is this commonality, right, between all these cells, the cells that differ in size, shape, function, and so on, they have the same chemistry, all right, the same coding blocks, okay, the same mechanisms for interpreting that code to produce proteins, that greatly simplifies the study of many aspects of molecular biology, right? So it's not organism specific. And that's why we as electrical engineers are even daring to go and study that, okay? Because if I have to study everything about all the organisms, you know, I don't have time for that, right? All right, now we'll talk about some model organisms. Okay, what are model organisms? Model organisms are organisms that are used for molecular biology studies, okay? So that means they have to be sim simpler organisms that will make the study feasible, all right? So model organisms must be simple and they must be capable of quickly replicating themselves so, so that we can get many copies at the same time, right? Or, or very quickly. In the case of bacteria, right, the model organism is E. coli bacteria, right? And E. coli, you hear about it all, all the time in the news. You know, some people have died of, after eating something contaminated with E. coli and so on. Okay, so it's, they're quite powerful, uh, quite potent, all right? They contain only a few genes very little DNA, right? Like the human genome, you have like four billion letters. These probably have a few thousand, okay? And they re the good thing is they reproduce every 20 minutes. Well, it's bad also because if you get an E. coli in infection, in no time, you they'll take over. Because every 20 minutes they're reproducing, that means, uh, you know, in an hour, it's going to be two to the power of three, eight times, okay? And then you do the calculation, you'll find in 24 hours, there are more than a billion descendants, okay? So in a couple of two, three days, you'll have more E. coli than there are humans on this earth. Okay, so. Now for flowering plants, it is the plant that is called Arabidopsis, right? And even this plant, is, the reason it's chosen as a model organism is because it produces thousands of offsprings in eight to 10 weeks. For insects, it is the Drosophila or the fruit fly. Okay, that is the model organism. Again, this reproduces quite fast. For mammals, of course, it cannot be humans, okay? It's rats and mice, right? Because nobody's going to let you produce humans to experiment, all right? And for the, in the case of unicellular eukaryotes, that means unicellular organisms, but unlike bacteria, they have a nucleus. The model organism is the yeast. Okay, that is used to produce 
alcohol by fermentation. Okay, we've finished the first chapter, and I think this is a good place to stop, all right? And uh, on Wednesday, we will start the review of uh, organic chemistry, okay? So are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, it probably will cover all the way up to the end of proteins, okay? Yeah, whatever I cover, maybe about a week before the test, you know. That's fair game, right? So, yeah. It'll be something like that, you know, maybe the first four chapters, you know. It depends on how quickly I can go. Oh, uh, well, there'll be some descriptive questions, there'll be some, you know, fill in the blanks and things like that, yeah. Yeah, you just study, don't worry about that, you know, leave, leave that to me, you know, uh, there, there is nothing, there will not be any trick questions, okay, you're not biology majors, even I don't even know what the tricks are, okay, so there'll be no trick questions, so you have to study and, you know, be able to answer those basic questions, all right, so there's nothing there to derail anybody, yes sir, go ahead. Oh, I have to send it to you. I, I'm going to email it to the whole mailing list, okay? Yeah, I, I will email it. Okay, it'll be probably a little bit later because I have to teach another class right now. Okay? Okay, thank you. So did you happen to get my email from this morning yet? Yeah, just one.